Hi everyone. You can Hello. see Prof has just joined us. You are welcome. Yeah. Good. Yeah. So you are welcome to this this session. Um, the session is focusing on the role of science in informing recovery from global crisis like COVID-19. The concept note came to the speakers much earlier with some proposed questions. So we'll try as much as possible to exhaust them. I propose that we have a two round of questions and a general discussion where um, you can contribute uh, in any way you, you wish to contribute to the topic of discussion. So Zahir, will you want to start? Just an introductory statement, together with your uh, introduction of yourself. Please go ahead. Hi, hi everybody. Thanks, Nana, for um, producing this subject. Uh, yeah, I think, um, yes, I'm Zahir Alam. I'm based in Mauritius. Uh, I'm a research associate from Deakin University. And I'm also a research associate for uh, Paris Auburn uh, in France. And um, for me, this is quite an interesting subject because I'm fascinated in cities. I'm an urban strategist by uh, profession. And uh, looking at the impacts of uh, the coronavirus in cities is, is amazing because at some point in time, almost half of the world's population was in the border. And uh, looking at the, not only the impact of cities, but at least fields is quite incredible. So I think this uh, panel is quite um, topical because it looks at the policy level perspective, and I'm quite um, Looking forward to exchanging with the uh, uh, panelists on this subject. Thank you. Thank you, Zahir. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> so my name is Jacques Belair. I'm a ma applied mathematician at the University of Montreal. So I've been doing mathematical modeling for more than 25 years, applied to biology, mainly physiology and a bit infectious diseases, but it was very mathematical. So the last few years have been um, quite interesting in informing the interplay between mathematics and public health policy decisions. And especially the last year has been quite uh, uh, informative in how the limitations of purely mathematical work uh, must confront reality. So I think there are a number of lessons that have been learned and um, I look forward to exchanging about them in this panel. Interesting. Thank you. I am the vice chancellor of uh, uh, a global university based uh, in rural Rwanda, uh, University of Health Science. And uh, we are very proud not to have closed uh, during the pandemic, even a single day, graduate all our students on time, recruit the next cohort on time, and face uh, zero cases uh, of COVID. However, I am a researcher myself and um, more focused on implementation science. And I have analyzing the countries around the world, countries who have implemented correctly the evidence-based inform um, uh, intervention uh, with the right strategies uh, co according to their context, national context and global context, are the ones who have succeeded, meaning minimum of death, minimum of disruption. And those who didn't follow evidence-based intervention failed implementation. Consequences are a lot of death, unnecessary death. And if Africa have done well so, so far, Thanks to CDC Africa, who have called all the ministers of health two months before uh, the first case in Africa, tell them, don't listen to the world, it's a serious issue. And um, that's to do at the first case in your country. And it was done. However, COVID-19, due to the lockdown, the slowdown of economy, the shrinking of the economy, we don't know the impact it will have in the future. For this, we need to work, to wait what we are going to discuss to all together here. And I can wait to hear your view. Thank you. Thank you very much. In the chat area, um, it said that you are a role model for African women in science everywhere. Thank you. 
Hello, everyone. Um, I'm I'm Tallulah Oni. I'm a I'm a public health physician by background and an urban epidemiologist. I work at the in Cambridge, a leader research group on urban health, and also an associate professor in in at the University of Cape Town. So my approach. Um, like uh, we have two city people actually on this on this panel, which is great. Um, is that here? So I focus on on rapidly growing cities um, across across Africa, um, and my approach is really around how we harness aspects of the urban environment for the creation of health equitably. So in the context of the uh, of the pandemic, I in this discussion I would like to introduce two particular concepts. One is around thinking about emergency health foresight, so in, as part of uh, emergency response. And by that, I mean how we think about the long-term um, intended and unintended consequences of actions taken in the midst of a crisis and the importance of thinking long-term and short-term in the acute period. And then the second term um, uh, aspect I'd like to focus on is the notion of proactive resilience. So you mentioned earlier about um, the, the theme for this panel being around thinking about resilience. Um, often that word is used in a problematic way as a response and a reaction. Um, I think that's incomplete. And I think that there is an opportunity to think about how we can be proactively resilient, um, particularly in the context of preventable emergencies and, and, and pandemics even. Because the reality is some things are less not preventable, but some things are. And those are determined by the actions that we take today. So I look forward to the discussion with the, with the other panelists. Thank you. That's interesting. And I think I will start right with you with my question. Um, we know the effect of COVID-19 pandemic is shaking up uh, global, social, economic, and health structures worldwide. Science has been and central to informing policy and society in the response to COVID-19 and ensuring the successful implementation of the design policies and the direction of the crisis recovery. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. This, we need to deal with importance of science in providing ways and methods of recovering from economic and social effects of COVID-19. Now I'll start with Tolula Oni with this question. What in your view, I mean based on your background, what's the role of science in guiding government COVID-19 response interventions? Okay, well I'll start with two two things. The first is that um, I don't, that science is not agnostic. And the second thing is that recovery is not agnostic. Um, and we often talk about both as if they were, they were predetermined. And what do I mean by that? Um, how we recover and what we recover into is very much grounded in our vision of where we want to go. And there are different paths that lie, that, that, that can be taken in that, in that sense. And similarly, um, the science, say, of, of equity um, is a deliberate act. So science is not by default equitable if we're not conscious about how we um, address in, in, inequalities. And so uh, it, it's critical that science plays a role, but that has to be, um, uh, I think, um, uh, from a perspective of thinking about how to ensure that from the exposure to the impact of the consequences of the short and, and longer term um, actions that are taken as part of the pandemic response are uh, equitably um, protecting and mitigating the, the negative health impacts. Um, and then the second thing I would say is that when we think about the science advice um, in the middle of, of, of a pandemic, um, there's a lot of the focus is on the actionable science. So, you know, we're in the middle of a pandemic now. What do we need to know? You know, should we be, should we be locking down? What is the, what is the R number doing? How is the, um, how do these interventions impact the transmission? Those are all really important. Uh, in addition to that, I would add that there's, it's critical that we think about strategic uh, science. So the science of what happens when we don't do things. So how do we think about in the middle of a crisis, 
What is, how are we considering the unintended consequences of non-COVID conditions um, and how can that inform how we tailor COVID responses? How can we think about the potential impact, say, of uh, restrictions on food insecurity and physical activity insecurity, given that we know that those uh, behaviours are critical to prevent uh, diseases down the line? Those things don't wait, right? So we're doing things now, and often the, 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 the thinking is that we're in the middle of the pandemic, we focus on now, and then when, when we come out, we think about the long term. And I would argue that there is a role for science in the middle of a crisis. We can't all be fighting fires. And I think that's, that's an important thing, right? So in the middle of the fire fighting, there needs to be people thinking, how do we prevent the fires? And how do we ensure that at the end of this, we are, we're not derailed from our path of, tri of, of achieving um, equitable health, uh, population health for all? So yes, I'll stop there. Yeah. Yeah, sure, you're right. And of course, in the middle of such a pandemic, uh, we need to, of course, consider the socio-economic situation of the countries. Um, I will continue with uh, Prof. Uh, Jack Bella. Um, with your experience, I'm sure you can assist us in addressing how scientific research can support policies to care with the pandemic. So, I mean, following the submission from uh, John, and then what are the failures? Prof. Uh, I, if I can um, uh, build upon the previous intervention, I think, uh, as you mentioned, there has to be a two-tier strategy. There's the immediate uh, problem that needs to be addressed, but it has to be in the context of much longer term solutions. And in fact, in many of the uh, action, actionable science for this pandemic, uh, the, the science was built upon previous instances. So the, uh, the building of capacity of a science establishment that can inform public policy was crucial in providing some scientific evidence. The big question, as I mentioned in my introductory remark, is how much is realistic and how does it uh, confront uh, actual implementation? So you can make uh, models and have the science of a given virus, a given epidemic, but the new epidemic is always slightly different. And the whole question is, what do you mean by slightly different? How big is the slight? So I think the, uh, in this context, the um, honesty of the scientist is crucial in having an impact. You can be overly optimistic or overly pessimistic, neither of which is particularly productive. So I think it's very important to have honesty honesty and the science you use, and this is how you get uh, policy decisions to be well informed, not only by the policy decision maker, but also the, the population that is being, uh, uh, that has consequences for this, these uh, actions. So I, I think the, um, it's very important to be very, uh, very open about the assumptions, and I think this is one, probably the most important lesson from the management of this pandemic, that there were hidden hypotheses. And in fact, this is a recurring theme in many of the technological interventions, uh, big data, artificial intelligence, lots and lots of uh, biases that, that are not uh, always uh, recognized or addressed. And I think there's the same uh, setup in informing uh, uh, decisions. And I think it's very important to have uh, a global perspective that you need to solve problems on a daily basis, on a weekly basis, but much longer term. And as was mentioned before, uh, social aspects are crucial. Inequalities must be incorporated in the planning. And I think this is uh, probably the most important lesson. 
and the most important uh, aspect to build upon in future uh, decision and recovery decisions. Thank you, Prof. Please go ahead. That's that's a, that's all right. Okay. Right. Thank you. Yeah, of course. You mentioned that uh, COVID comes in uh, a bit different, and I think that demands also probably different approach in dealing with that. So this would take us to Prof. Uh, Agnes, if you permit me, um, what structural changes? <laughs> <laughs> okay, what structural changes would you recommend to African research institutions, you being a researcher as well, to better respond to COVID-19 and combat other future pandemics? So I think, first of all, to take a lesson of uh, what, what the world has done, what Africa has done, successfully or missed up because there is portion of the world who missed up portion who did quite well but differently but all the countries that have done well have done exactly the same thing but adapted mm. to their context huh? so never try to copy past what the others are doing huh? uh, copy the the, the 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 golden lesson are always uh, bring always the people who do that on the wall copy the principle the strategies, adapt that to your context. So for me, I will love that in our universities, whatever university, whatever course you have, you study implementation science, the science to implement, to solve any problem according your context and uh, what you know. So already the world knew what to do. You know why? Because China has done it months before Europe, two months before Europe, three months before Africa. So we knew it was just a matter to take your call, the phone call, and ask your colleague in China, they were very willing to answer you. What to do, what not to do, and according to your context, you are that. So uh, what I, um, I will propose to researchers is to end his in hand with uh, different type of uh, scientific uh, discipline with decision makers to, to analyze what has happened. Where were we good? Where did we fail? Where were we, uh, we were ready? Where we were not ready? And why? The why is more important than the fact. So that we can be ready for the next time better. Hmm? And knowing that the next time is totally unpredictable. We don't know where the virus will come. It can come from Neptune. It can come from a forest near you. You don't know. But you have to be ready and there and study the best practice. Because there are some countries who got no death. How come? It was possible. And there are some countries who didn't get the economy disturbed directly. How come? So there is a lot to learn and also for the researchers how to promote production of all those good Africa was, this one, uh, was missing. How can we start to produce those respirators, those everything uh, that we are capable to produce and we are not producing. So capacity building and uh, how to collaborate better in, across institutions and uh, how to promote research based on equity. Because as the two previous speakers have said, based whatever you do on equity, uh, call success. For example, in Africa, we have a lot of poor people, a lot of informal sectors. We know that if we need a lockdown, don't lock people without feeding them. Don't love them without compensate them partially with what they were missing. And in Rwanda, they did so. And that's how now we are reopening. Uh, we still have cases because we are a long country. We cannot avoid it, but it's well managed. And we had only, uh, like many other countries, uh, 50 deaths. So 
lesson taken how to produce better for our future to be more resilient we need to produce better what we need and how to promote the science of implementation and uh, better collaboration and strategies inclusive strategies including the people thank you thank you prof i will i, I picked a, a content one or two sentences from your submission and the need to show the control on the pandemic most of the time the scientific assumptions are peddled i mean paraded as medical facts in news and in the population across the world zahir in your view what do you think is the right strategy to better communicate scientific results and inform the public in such situations Thank you, Nana. Uh, listening from the previous panelists is quite interesting because there's one key word that is emerging. Uh, it's that of uh, equity. Everybody's talking about equity and we, we understand why, because recovery will be a key milestone and we need to do it well. And it's quite interesting because at the beginning of the pandemic, we all understood the urgency of the situation and we, uh, some policies were uh, we're right to be on health over economics, but it looks like now the recovery from the original panelists will be geared towards people over economics. And this is quite interesting because we're turning the, the wheels around. Uh, going to your question, yes, I think uh, right in the beginning, uh, when, when we started mapping the emergence of the pandemic and uh, we started seeing the kind of importance of uh, medical researchers guiding policy on a national and urban scale. I think this is the first time, I mean, I'm, I'm quite young and in my lifetime, I've never saw that before. It's like we started learning about new fields of medicine in itself and the importance um, of how we can lead towards the viability factor of cities and also the immediate viability of uh, economic ecosystems. And yes, I do agree with the others that um, the role of um, science and all that in guiding policy is now more important than ever. But it's uh, but looking at the unfolding of the pandemic, it's quite interesting from an urban scale. Because look at it this way, since the beginning of the pandemic, when it started, we, we saw abrupt uh, policies uh, influenced by health experts, but only from a, let's say, linear, if, I, if we need to be critical, only from a linear perspective, health uh, in itself. And what, what did it result in? It's like we saw cities sometimes with millions of inhabitants and a strict lockdown and often without um, a thinking of how to feed those populations how those populations can still sustain themselves economically what are the support needed uh, economic support to be able to sustain those families in need and what did we see all around the world some cities in china started buying even themselves then we saw societal inequity actually rising from the management of the pandemic geared only on the linear thinking the thinking, the principles behind it was right, but I think at the beginning there was a lack of coherence from uh, interdisciplinary approach. And this, I think, will be a legacy that we will, uh, will be left with after the pandemic. It's quite interesting as well to see how those um, reacted differently in different contexts. Uh, like Prof. Agnes was saying, like there is no one-size-fits-all policy. And it's quite interesting. In China, you saw, for example, the emergence of barricades. People were fearing... Uh, uh, of some neighborhoods that may be con contaminated getting into there, so they started making makeshift barricades. You see, a city within a city. In uh, in the United States, people were lining up outside gun stores. Uh, we, we don't really know why. In Amsterdam, they were lining out outside uh, coffee shops for marijuana consumption. And some other places in Australia, they were finding uh, aisles for toilet paper. It's like nobody knows why, but there's some kind of funny psychological uh, behaviors as well happening. And Scott quite interesting to see how health-guided policies are being impacted, but um, sometimes we don't really understand uh, the Im impacts on different uh, fields as well. Uh, we also saw the emergence of uh, high and report unemployment numbers. And again, this uh, increased and highlighted the, the inequality aspect of this and the, how economic stimulus packages came into effect to support the, those economies. But now the question, is not only on how to support those economies short term, but also when we kickstart our economy. And I think this 
idea that the panelists have been hammering about of, of equities will be important going forward because how to do recovery and how to do it right going forward. Thank you. Thank you very much, Zahir. I will urge the, our audience to, to, to send their questions, comments in the, in the chat. Then I will read them to the panelists and then we address them. I have two sets of questions uh, which we will discuss all through. So I will not mention your name. But then if you feel like uh, coming in, uh, you may probably prompt me. Now, how does a, a, new, a young African scientist, what role can a young African scientist play in the global map in supporting these uh, policies to be implemented based on scientific facts? This, I, I leave it open for submissions. I mean, make your suggestions on this. Prof, you want to start first, He's smiling. <laughs> yeah, because, uh, you know, it's always like that. When you say it's open, everybody will remain quiet. But I believe, you know, young, science, uh, young researcher, middle aged researcher, old researcher, we all have the same uh, duty, the same responsibility. So that means uh, we need to, first of all, as African, develop your self-esteem, guys. Uh, when I say as African, also as people from the developing world, in Asia as well, COVID has shown what we are capable of. And most of the case, we are going beyond the Western researchers and be a little bit too humble. So self-esteem first. Second, play a role in building research capacity in where you are, in your continent, in your building research capacity, in embed research capacity in all type of courses. Even when you learn administration and finance, even when you learn whatever. And also uh, equip, uh, contribute to equip students in the skills to carry on research on their own work and other things but also to understand how to use data and also build beneficial partnership and create um, an avoid brain drain. Serve your continent. Sometimes you cannot come back, but at least serve your continent, whatever place you are. And know that in science, in data backed by science, I trust. If not, it's God. Out of that zero, it's chance, and we cannot grow on on chance. Yeah, thank you, thank you very much. Yeah, when this pandemic hit and it took really like an international scale, global a global scale, we saw uh, how publications, uh, peer reviewed publications that all, that were paid, were suddenly becoming temporary open access. And this is quite interesting because suddenly we're having access to publications that researchers would never dream of having before. And some institutions maybe cannot afford to do so. And this is quite interesting, but unfortunately, this is only temporary. And second, uh, second part of it, I think the access to funds for publishing in open access journal is still an issue. While uh, access to some journals uh, have been made temporary accessible, but still, to publish in those journals, we have to pay. So uh, coming from institutions that cannot afford or centers associated to institutions that cannot afford to publish in those journals, then we will still automatically put those research researchers one kilometer back from the starting race. And I think this is quite an, an important question to address in the long term, beyond the pandemic. While we saw the emergence of funds, um, emergency funds from organizations, philanthropic organizations opening uh, options to researchers to, for access to publishing open access uh, journal again this is only temporary for the COVID-19 pandemic. So I think looking at the ecosystem in the publishing industry, access to information would be quite critical to better encourage uh, young researcher, researchers to be more on an equitable ground and to go into deeper global debates. Thank you. Thank you. 
Prof, you may be the last but not the least on this. I think the the the, yes, the most important notion is to um, to a adapt to the current situation and to the particular situation. So as was mentioned before, you, there are general principles which must be um, tailored to the particular situation. And I think different jurisdictions have had different approaches and the one size fits all doesn't fit any. And I think it's very important to find the right balance between general principles and uh, particular situations. And some a priori uh, were uh, eventually discovered to be not so um, suitable uh, to most situations. And I, I think the, um, the very fact that, as was mentioned, the data must be um, an aid to the decision, but you cannot just rely on data, and the data also must be uh, the proper data. So you cannot just uh, transform and translate different strategies without adapting them to your particular situation. And um, I am reminded of uh, the terrible and the very dark forecasts about what will happen in Africa. And those were just bad forecasts. And I think probably completely outside the realm of uh, what was to be expected. So for young scientists, I think the African situation is what must be kept in mind. and. Uh, one must not be uh, intimidated by whatever uh, uh, people are doing from outside their your own reality. I think that's that's the crucial thing. And in forward looking, uh, that that must be read, uh, brought, that must be brought uh, to bear on the decisions. Two aspects of, of your of your of your question, Nana. The first is is asking the right questions. Um, I think that's absolutely critical. If we're not asking the right questions, we don't have um, uh, the evolution of a science that can help address um, problems of today and tomorrow. And critical to that is an enabling environment. Um, uh, several years ago. I, I wrote, I wrote a, a paper about the importance of allowing scientists to pivot um, for impact. And part of the reason I wrote that was out of sheer frustration because when you speak to, when you read interviews from Nobel laureates and established people, they talk about how a lot of the accidental discoveries where they focus on something and then they see something and they pivot that way. And, and, and then we talk about wanting younger researchers to have the impactful work. But we, we, the reality of a lot of our science systems actually are rigid and, and, and don't encourage uh, that pivoting. So I think as a science system, we have to ask ourselves, in what ways can we make the environment enabling so that um, uh, early career researchers coming through ask, firstly, are able to ask the right questions and are able to understand how to apply their tools and bring that with them and pivot in ways that they're not penalized um, uh, for. Um, and then the second aspect is, because um, I think you, you talked a little bit about uh, informing um, policy. I think that's a, a, a trickier one uh, because that is uh, requires a, an effective uh, science advisory structure. And some of the things that we, some of the experience that we've had um, or we've seen in the context of COVID um, globally is to some extent the inadequacies of the science advice structures, both in terms of the voices and perspectives that are fed in, right? So there's absent voices and then you realize that they're unintended impact, but also um, the timeliness and the and the um, importance of building that trust and those those bridges before an emergency. Um, so, so I think those are really critical aspects. But overarching all of this, um, I truly believe health is political. Right? And I don't mean that as necessarily in terms of party politics and, and even at the national level, but engaging with strategies to long-term uh, 
protect and produce health is a political choice and that requires leadership. Um, and we see that in the different approaches to uh, the COVID response. Um, I work in, in, in urban health, right? So I'm used to working, I, I, I'm, I'm, a me, I'm a medical doctor, but I work more with architects and urban planners and transport engineers than with anyone in the healthcare sector, because as public health, we say, most of the factors that influence health lives are the healthcare sector, but we don't engage with those very sectors that produce health. Um, and previous to COVID, they've been huge, you know, it's been really challenging work because the this, this sectors are siloed and people work across, oh, that's not really what I do. Suddenly COVID hit. There's not a single sector that said, oh, no, COVID, oh, that's a health thing. I don't do health. That didn't happen. Everybody rolled up their sleeves and said, what can I do? This is a, this is a cross societal problem. How can we, how can whatever I do, whether it's a manufacturing uh, ventilation, whether it is supporting food security, whatever, how can I produce health? The critical issue is that health does not trickle down from good intentions, right? We have to be proactive and say, what role do I play across, across sectors in potentially contributing to equitable health production? And how can that be sustained? And how can that interest um, be sustained in the long term? And our experience of COVID has shown that it is possible. Uh, so a lot of the impossibilities um, of, oh, no, we can't work that way, that's not what we do, none of that works when we're reacting. The critical issue, and this is where leadership and the both um, politically, but also in the science structures to say, well, how can we examine um, our science structures and our systems? And how can we adapt that to ensure that what we're doing is is supporting the kind of science that allows us to be able to reflect on on these possibilities and not get comfortable within the sectors and the and the silos of what we're comfortable with because that that's that's how we, we work very incrementally until we we need to um Ria, and i think somebody else maybe is here can speak to this because you're talking about climate change right which is a, a pandemic uh, and a critical urgent global emergency and yet we don't have this, if we look at, if we look at the, the amount of critical action that's taken for, for COVID, and we're sitting on our, on our, um, on our hands for climate change. Yeah. Um, I saw a question in the Q&A around how do we learn, learn lessons about um, uh, COVID not being the equalizer that we thought we were. It starts by asking what, 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 what are we doing? What, why are we not, how do we get the exigence and the motivation to, to get uncomfortable and to ask the uncomfortable questions that mean that require fundamental and structural disruptions in how we how we perform science and how we see the role of wow. science from from education to application. Wow, this is comprehensive. I don't know if we have any more time to get to you on your concluding remarks, but allow me to get through the other panelists on their last words our time is far spent but i have this burning critical issue you see as we we talking about the young african scientists the issue of a rural girl or a rural girl comes to mind or rural youth young african comes to mind i mean how do we treat such in a situation like this obviously it's not supposed to be going to be the same situation as we have an urban youth so the treatment will definitely be a little bit different from um from uh, a rural youth um this is a youth who is unable to access internet but of course to want to do everything uh, a youth a scientist will want to do so issue of accessibility and affordability comes in here. So as I, I go around to take your concluding remarks, you may touch on these points also for me. But I like it anyway, I will say a few words to conclude myself. So please, um, I will invite your concluding statements as you bring in um, one or two uh, points on the rural youth. African youth. Shall we start with Zahir? 
uh, thank you, Nana. I think, yeah, this is quite an um, interesting question as well, because often, uh, and on this panel, we have two people talking cities, and then often, what about rural areas? And interestingly, during the pandemic, the debate has been um, around of, is all rural areas safer than cities? And is density actually an issue, while previously we thought density was more sustainable? And uh, before without going into the details of um, how we can interpret those data and uh, analogies, I think cities will still be there for a very long time and more density is actually more sustainable. But um, looking at rural areas is quite important as well. I think your question talks about one education and uh, for the for the youth and also uh, if you want um, equity, future equity, financial uh, responsibility and financial um, uh, independence will talk also about work in rural areas. How do the youth access access to work? And I think this question is kind of in two parts. One uh, on education. And during this pandemic, we saw how some universities all around the world were impacted, one from the lack of foreign uh, capital from foreign students uh, flocking into universities and impacting them. And bricks and mortar, traditional universities suffered from this. Whereas some New York universities, which invested early on in uh, distance education, were still, were still thriving. One example, I'm an urbanist. One example is Curtin University from Australia. They were the first in the world that provided uh, distance education fully accredited for architecture. And while other universities were suffering, their intake is actually shooting off the roof. And this is quite interesting. And they are only university which went there 50 years ago. And this is quite interesting for me. This is a real innovation. And I think going forward, we we'll need to provide ecosystem support for those industries and similar ideas for not only uh, encouragement, but also strong signals from government, policy signals, fiscal mechanism, fiscal um, incentives for two, one for providers to encourage those institutions to shift to those um, for distance learning and, and similar infrastructures, but also for, for users, for those students to encourage access, to subsidize internet costs, subsidize software, hardware, and also economic relief to allow them to go to, towards university instead of a job outside university. And I think a second part of the question is about infrastructure. And I think this one uh, is quite interesting because I think we are seeing a new shift in infrastructure. In the future, we won't even need physical infrastructure, broadband, for intent. While we are still debating 5G, Samsung a few months ago released a report on 6G. Oh. And a few months, uh, we, in the beginning of the year, we've been reading about Elon Musk's uh, idea of starting with 12,000 satellites beaming internet of the earth. And a few months ago, again, we read the report of how rural America, which were before witnessing the speeds of 2 megabytes per second, is now enjoying over 100 megabytes per second at an incredibly low cost. So I think this will change the world incredibly. We are disconnecting from hard infrastructure to soft infrastructure. I think the dynamics will change completely in the, in the debate on this question. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Zahil Alam, for the submission. It looks like we have just two, two minutes to give this concluding uh, remarks. Uh, Prof. Agnes, you may, you may come in on this. So thank you very much. I'm just going to answer to Zaire because the fight for open access is more than 10 years that you are doing it. And uh, we should all stack on it. Why our countries are giving access to do research in, on our people without obliging people to uh, uh, publish in open access? So it's up to you. We, ha we have enough. Uh, suddenly, uh, for data, data are real we need to be accountable and what the 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 security global index has done so saying that we are dead in africa with covid they didn't base their research on real data they just give assumption of white supremacists to believe that africa was supposed to be dead it's not evidence-based and we should make people accountable they take a lot of money to do such a stupid report they should reimburse the money and they should apologize. You're right. Thank you, Prof. Prof. Jack. Um, <laughs> I, uh, don't wait for the chair. Huh? Don't, don't wait for the reimbursement. <laughs> uh, to, to address your issue about uh, 
rural uh, girls, I think the the key word is education, uh, sure. infrastructure, economic policies. There's some technology, but I'm always uh, worried about the magical technological silver bullet that will solve everything. I'm reminded of the significant amount of money that was invested in um, high capacity wiring and fiber optics before the Wi-Fi became prevalent. So you have to make sure you pick the right technology. But I think that's that's really what should be the government's priorities to bring education to rural areas. Um, I, I suspect that's not very original solution, but I, I think that's that's where you have you must start. And um, thank you. The ecosystem and the, the policies and the, everything will then follow from that. I'm always reminded of uh, the role education plays in development. So I think this it's almost the the alpha and the omega. That's good. <laughs> thank you very much. Dr. Tomila Oni, then you have two minutes. Oh, I think I took up quite a lot of time in the run up to this. So I'm happy to yield yield my time. Um, suffice to say I support um, what the uh, what the other panelists have, have have mentioned and that critically uh, we need to take a, a systems approach. Um, across Africa, we've been dealing with issues of complexity and uncertainty on a day-to-day -day basis. And, and increasingly globally, this is what we will have to do. And, the, and science has to rise to the challenge um, in tr driving and changing the norms across society um, of, of addressing complexity and uncertainty. Um, and I think the, our education systems and how we train the next uh, crop of, of scientists would be critical to ensure that um, that we have um, equal access to education, but also the kind of education that is able to respond not just to the problems of today, but the um, but to anticipate and to prevent um, the, the challenges of tomorrow. Uh, we have learned a lot from these interesting discussions. I am not, of course, able to summarize all, but a few points we may probably take home. Um, Find a balance between general principles and particular situations. Mm -hmm. I think this is very important and strong point. Data, not just any data, also relates very well with never try to copy faster. What others are doing, ask the right questions. And we've learned that open access has been around for some time and it's helpful to the young, especially young Africans. Touching on the issue of climate change and uh, putting it side by side COVID-19, um, of course, I also believe that we have not come really to terms with or accepted the risk climate change uh, possibly can bring on, on, on our life and our society. You see, climate change can erode the very existence of humans, so, it's important that as we put measures in place for COVID-19, we equally put measures in place for climate change risk. I'm happy for this session, and I believe our audience have also learned a lot. I'd like to thank you very much, and I hope we'll, we'll find time to, to communicate further. Thank you very much. I will end it here. This is all the time will allow us for. And I wish you the best of the evening, morning, afternoon, wherever you are. Thank you. Bye-bye.